Okay, this is uh, lecture 26 on uh, an introduction to surface runoff. And we're going to talk about drainage basins, which we've already talked about uh, a little bit in the previous lecture. And then we'll discuss storm hydrographs. The drainage basin is, uh, is basically another word for watershed or drainage area or catchment. And that's a topographic area that collects and discharges surface stream flow through one outlet or mouth. So this is basically, uh, you can see a, a relief map here. And you've got a stream with various uh, uh, streams coming together here with a, with a bigger stream uh, at the outlet. And the dotted line here is, or the dashed line is essentially the drainage divide. And we've covered this a little bit earlier, but you can see that water that would fall on this side of the dashed line would flow out here this end. And water that flows, at, uh, that would, uh, rain that falls on this side of the dashed line would go the other way. When we talk about drainage patterns, we have uh, <clears throat> four that are on your screen here, but uh, we've got uh, dendritic, which is a branch like a tree, and this is a, a typical situation where you have uh, rock and strata and soils that are, are of equal resistance and erosivity, and so you get an equal likelihood of having a stream develop in one spot versus in the other. Uh, if you have rectangular, that's typically in faulted terrain where you have less resisted rock, and then we have trellis on folded terrain, and that's uh, essentially um, uh, a uh, situation that ha typically happens where you have folded mountains like the Washita Range in Arkansas or the Appalachians in the eastern United States, where you have these uh, areas of lesser um, resistance to rock or to, to erosion than others, and, and essentially um, you uh, you get this uh, this trellis uh, pattern that forms. And then here on the lower right, we've got, um, we've got a trellis on uh, mature dissected coastal plain. So you'd see that out in the Piedmont area of uh, eastern uh, United States. Uh, this is an example of the trellis uh, uh, in the Washita uh, Range in, in Arkansas. And you've seen these slides before when I talked about the 2010 flood. But uh, uh, essentially... Um, what you've got is you've got these folded segments here where you've, you've got this, uh, these uplifted features and then the, uh, the streams form in the middle and you have the uh, drainages coming off the side in a, in a trellis pattern or these uh, stream channels coming off the side in a trellis pattern. When we talk about stream order um, and specifically stream order number, we, we would look at a drainage basin here and we would have uh, first order streams coming together to form second order streams. So a first order stream is a small unbranched tributary. A second order stream uh, occurs when you have two first order streams coming together. A third order stream uh, is formed by two second order streams coming together and so on and so forth. If you have a Second order stream joined by a first order stream, that does not make a third order stream. So you have to have two second order streams coming together to make a third order stream like you have in this situation right here. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, on down here, we've got a fourth order stream with a first order that does not make a fifth order stream. And so you can kind of see, get an idea of the, uh, of the sch scheme that's used to classify a stream order. Let's talk about some definitions, and we've got perennial streams, which are a continuous flow regime typical of well-defined channel in a humid climate. So you've got stream flow there uh, year-round. Intermittent streams are generally have flow occurring during the wet season, and during the dry season, you have the uh, stream goes dry. It's not uh, fed uh, by groundwater uh, year-round. And then ephemeral streams uh, generally have flow uh, during and for a short time following a rainfall event. So these are streams that uh, really are only there because of uh, they're only flowing when you have uh, an active rainfall event that uh, was able to, to be uh, intense enough to generate runoff. Uh, we've already talked about this a little bit, but a stream flow hydrograph is a relation of flow rate and time at a particular location on a stream. Uh, hydrograph, I like this uh, definition from Vin T. Chow's uh, Handbook of Applied Hydrology in 1964. It's basically an integral expression of the physiographic and climatic characteristics that govern the relation between rainfall and runoff of a particular drainage basin. And so if we look at this, we can see at the top we've got this idealized uh, hydrograph where you've got discharge plotted on the y-axis 
We also have the rainfall height of graph in inches or millimeters. So this would be uh, incremental rainfall uh, for a particular time step. And on the x-axis, we've got time. And you can see that the hydrograph is here. And, and we've got some base flow going on here. And then we have this rain event. And we have a response to the uh, rain. And so you've got some of the flow is due to uh, interflow. That's the, the water that goes in the unsaturated zone and the shallow groundwater system into the stream. You've got base flow, uh, I want, might uh, want to mention here, is that that's base flow is attributable to the, to the groundwater. Uh, flow and you can see that during in this uh, slide right here but basically base flow is what feeds the system uh, from the groundwater system uh, what feeds the rain the runoff in a stream from the groundwater system and then we've got saturated overland flow which is basically the excess precipitation as it runs across the, the uh, surface of the ground that is the saturated overland flow and so these three components base flow interflow and the saturated overflow make up a hydrograph and so if you look at um, the dry period sources for stream flow, you've got the base flow component, uh, and, that's, uh, and, and you do have some return flows, which would be maybe from the effluent from a wastewater treatment plant. And then during wet periods, you've got precip, you've got saturated overland flow, you've got interflow, and then you've got the water table. And you should notice here that the water table rises during wet periods, and so you can see in this schematic, the, the water table is just basically intersecting the stream down here for the space flow, whereas in this case, the water table is, is quite much, is, is, a, is a lot higher. During the dry periods, uh, we've got um, uh, areas of seepage that are shown here in the gray, and you've got the streams coming out here uh, with the flowing stream, and during wet periods after a rainfall, uh, you can see that you've got much more saturated areas and areas where you've got seepage that's providing uh, 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 flow into this into the uh, stream stream system. All right, runoff. Uh, just uh, basically, just some some points here to discuss is defined by the variation of uh, abstraction processes and spatial and temporal patterns of rainfall. So, basically, the abstractions would be things like the initial abstraction for when you have it raining and it's being caught by the leaves and the potholes on your driveway and and uh, in in the uh, stream in the fields and things, and then you've got the uh, the abstraction that's due to infiltration, and then you have something you know, the abstraction is due to evapotranspiration. We've discussed all those topics. Uh, when abstractions have been satisfied, so that means when the infiltration is met, when the um, when the initial abstractions are met, and when your evapotranspiration is met you have overland flow that begins. And this overland flow eventually moves into the drainage channels and becomes channel flow. So you have it coming across the overland, the upland areas, the, the hill slopes, and then it goes into an organized channel and becomes channel flow. And when this channel flow begins to occur, the channel hydraulics dominate the runoff characteristics. When it's in the uplands and the hill slopes, um, the roughness of the hill slopes, uh, the way that water would uh, come uh, off of a hill slope is different than when it's in the channel and it's organized uh, when, when, and it's driven by the channel hydraulics, which we've covered earlier in the class. Uh, the the uh, you know things like the uh, Manning equation would be um, the primary method which would, would predict the uh, the, the uh, hydraulics of a of a of a stream channel, or at least uh, how they behave during uniform flow, if we know the slope. The dominant basin characteristics controlling response to effective rainfall. Uh, we've, we kind of allude to this a little bit uh, when we talk about the USGS regression equations. We're typically looking at things like drainage area and slope of the channel, and slope of the watershed, hydraulic roughness, natural and, and uh, channel storage, stream length, channel density, antecedent moisture condition, which means what is the ground like, how wet is it, how saturated is it prior to the onset of rainfall. And then we talk about vegetation, channel modifications, and, and other things. Let's look at uh, some examples of the basin characteristics. Let's look at a gentle uh, uh, slope versus a steeper slope. As you have the same amount of runoff or rainfall occurring, you can see that the hydrograph for a gentler sloped watershed uh, is not as peaked as it is if the watershed is steeper. If we have a less rough versus a more rough watershed, you can see that again we have more peak in this when it's less rough there's less impeding the flow getting accumulating into the drainage 
uh, system and in, into the, uh, the stream channels where if it's more rough you've got more things uh, impeding the, the runoff process. Uh, if we've got storage in the watershed, if we've got a small amount, let's say ponds or dams, uh, we've, we've got uh, less versus more. You can see that when we have more storage that really slows the rainfall runoff response and so the hydrograph is much uh, shallower, uh, less peaked, and it's drawn out over a long period of time because you're letting you're storing water and then releasing it later as the uh, as time goes on and the and the main bulk of the rainfall is over. Whereas if you have little storage, there's nothing that keeps that uh, rain uh, the effective runoff the effective rainfall becoming runoff and running right into the stream flow, uh, the stream channels, and then we've got high density versus low density land use. If you've got a lot of urbanization, rooftops, guttering. Uh, concrete for your pavement, concrete for your driveway, concrete or asphalt for parking lots. It's going to run off much quicker with high density population and urbanization than it would for low density. And then if your stream channels are very short uh, to the area, the outlet of the watershed, uh, it doesn't have as far to go. So you can see that for shorter links versus longer links of your watershed length, uh, you can see that the response is, is variable with that. If we look at the effect of rainfall or the storm characteristics, if we have the bulk of our rainfall occurring early on in the storm versus later in the storm, you can see that the hydrograph peaks much quicker and, and uh, goes uh, down uh, quicker as opposed to having the bulk of the rainfall in the latter part of the storm. You get this slow rise and all of a sudden it picks up steam and, and peaks uh, later in the, uh, in the comparative cycle and then falls off rather quickly. Let's look at the way the storm would fall if I had a nice uniform uh, storm all over the entire watershed versus in one small part. Well, the volume of runoff would be different. It would be much greater in Storm B because it's covering uh, the entire watershed uh, as opposed to Storm A, which is on the very uh, end of it. You can see when it, that rainfall begins way up here, it takes a long time for that water to run from the upper part of the watershed off to the lower part. So Storm A is quite a bit different. It peaks much later than Storm B. If we look at the way a storm moves, and if we look from point A to point B, if we have the storm moving from A to B, the, the watershed, uh, the hydrograph peaks much quicker than if the uh, storm goes from B to A, but the, the, even though there may be the same volume under both these curves, the peak is much greater because as the storm moves from B to A, uh, the, the rain that begins here and is falling here, that's uh, arriving at about the same time the storm is moving and dumping its rain over the middle part and then over the end. So you get this much more uh, uh, peaked hydrograph with a larger uh, uh, peak uh, magnitude for the, the runoff than you would if the storm were moving counter uh, to it. You get more runoff quicker, but you're moving away. And so by the time rainfall hits up here at B, the part that was at uh, the lower part of the basin is already off, and so you don't get the, the, as much of a peak. Okay, that uh, concludes Lecture 26.